I uh, want to talk about uh, collaboration, uh, cooperation, uh, improvement in outcomes and uh, lowering cost. It's not commonly things you hear about in health these days, it's usually the other way around. Uh, competition uh, and increasing costs. Um, so we'll just walk through uh, where we're at with the New Zealand registry. I also want to acknowledge Cyril who's come over from uh, Movember in Australia. Uh, Movember is uh, great to see in a similar entity to the Prostate Cancer Foundation. Uh, they're both uh, very good entities at raising profile of men's health issues um, and uh, really good to see that cooperation with Movember again and welcome Cyril. What I want to do is talk about the New Zealand Prostate Registry and why registries are so important nowadays. Uh, in traditional health education where we do a research study that's commonly a randomised controlled study, that means people don't know which treatment arm they're in, they're very time consuming, they take a lot of resources and they then require uh, review by statisticians and then publication, the average time for publication is around two years. Uh, on average if you do a study and you show an outcome that is beneficial, it takes 15 years to translate that change into clinical practice. Registries are where you have information coming back to people who are treating patients based on their outcomes and the average time for change of practice is one year. So there's a significant change available because information is being fed back to those who are undertaking the treatment. So registries nowadays offer hope for improvement in quality and thus lowering the cost and that's done by a cooperative translation of data, patient information, into things that are relevant for people that are treating them. So this project could not get off the ground without Movember who are funding it and they've agreed to fund that for a minimum of three years. Monash University is the Australian centre where all of the data will be held and it took us around six months to get an agreement that we could hold information on New Zealand patients in Australia because of IT privacy and security issues. The Ministry of Health through the task force are supportive of this. The Royal Australasian College of Surgeons are supportive of registries. The Urological Society of Australia and New Zealand are supportive of the registry and we've set up a charitable trust called a Centre of Health Outcomes Measures New Zealand to be able to run the entity because we need a process of employing people and paying for activities. Why have I got a picture of James Bond or Roger Moore up there? He was diagnosed with prostate cancer around two years ago. And he came from a background where he generally did the right thing and knew what to do. He, however, had a number of questions he had to answer. Will I survive? Will I be treated well? And what will I be like afterwards? And as we've heard, there are a myriad of treatment options available. And he was the sort of person who came from a background who generally did the right thing and had a good outcome. His main question was would he live or would he love again? As we've heard in prostate cancer, and I just want to point this out a little bit in detail, this is a graph of different surgical outcomes by different operations. In prostate cancer surgery there are patient factors that we've heard of, surgeon factors that we've heard of, and this graph looks at things like hip and knee operations, gallbladder operations and right down the far end there's prostate cancer surgery and the wider the graph the more variable the outcome of surgery. So it's a type of operation where there's quite a wide variation in outcomes for a large number of different reasons. So it's ripe for improving the outcome by giving feedback on it. Where some of the other operations are much more standardised and the outcomes are very similar. So what do we see as success from the registry? Well, success from the registry would be in two years' time that we have enrolled 90% of new patients with prostate cancer and have outcome measures from those patients who are diagnosed fed back to the clinicians who are treating those patients so they know how well they are doing to improve their quality. 
that would be what success would be defined as. So what's our current status? Well, we have been funded my, by Movember. We have now a project manager appointed. We've got IT support and we've undertaken data collection. And in the Canterbury region, we have actually been doing this now for three years with a bit of experience. And we now want to scale that up to be something that is capable of being undertaken nationally. The basic data set that we are looking at collecting is all new cases of prostate cancer. And demographic data means things like age, ethnicity, region, time of diagnosis. Clinical stage means the extent of the disease. Is it localised, curable, or is it advanced and more controllable, not curable? The clinical grade, as we've talked about, is the aggressiveness or the tissue under the microscope. So collecting all of this data and pulling it together. Then we'd look at what the treatment decision is, the treatment timing by surgeon and by region. And then we'd look at the outcome. And then the outcome measures are standardised and that's already undertaken through the Monash registry. And it's things like, for example, what percentage of patients who had low risk disease were put on active surveillance? And that's something that you can compare to other centres and look at whether you're getting equity of access to care by different regions. And for example, surgical skill when you do an operation and you expect the disease is localised, how many of the times is it localised? And there's variation in that, and I'll show you some of the results that have come through from both us and from overseas. And then we'll look at PSA down the track, which says how well have you cured the patient, and PROMS is an acronym for Patient Reported Outcome Measures, Patient's Continence and Erectile Dysfunction and Quality of Life. And so those will be studied pre-treatment and to 12 monthly post-treatment. What are the requirements of the program to be successful? How would we get that success? Well, we need to have a process of confirming all new notifications of prostate cancer cases. We need a system that's scalable around the country in both public and private for data collection. And we've got that system available here and we're looking at standardising that to make that scalable. We need to establish a steering committee that deals with the results. How do we look at the results? How are they best handled? We need to appoint a local person within each DHB to be responsible for the process because they can collect data from their region. We need to obtain ethics approval by region and ethics for this because it is a de-identified outcomes registry, which means an individual patient's results will not be known to the whole group, but it's the collective of patients that surgeon is treating. You don't need patients to sign individual ethics forms, which is quite a detailed process and an additional cost, but mainly a barrier to success because we couldn't advance that in the time frames. And then we need to expand things region by region. The results will be confidential and available to the pre people treating those patients and I'll talk a little bit about that in the future but the overall goal is to improve the quality of care and improve access to care. So here's some sort of outcome measures that we would be thinking about. This is from the Christchurch Public Hospital and may answer a couple of questions that have cropped up. So what's this a little graph about? Well this is when we first started collecting the results aligned to the registry, which is aligned to the Monash database, aligned to the international registry requirements, 340 cases in our public hospital, that's a 14 month period. Of all of the new cases that came in, 41% patients went on to active surveillance, 28% had a radical prostatectomy, of which a number went privately, and 4% had that undertaken robotically and a number underwent external beam radiotherapy and some started off with hormone therapy first. So we've got the ability to say in the Christchurch public hospital region is our access to treatment equivalent to what is done overseas or, are we got, or have we got a blockade to access to treatment? This is a mechanism of looking at the same things around the rest of the country. The next thing we wanted to know was we are a training centre and we wanted to know a perfectly valid question, how do we know whether the training is putting patients at risk because training is an apprenticeship type thing. Under supervision, trainees undertake part of the operation, evolving over time to become more independent. 
So we have here a graph of the consultant primarily doing the operation and the registrar designated as primarily doing the operation and looking at patient outcomes, looking at continence at 12 months by a pad per day use of incontinence. And then we can compare that to what happens in the British system, which we've got three years of data on, which is very equivalent. So we can comfortably say that training is not putting patients at risk and that our outcomes are equivalent to what is benchmarked overseas. And that's something we think is important, talking to patients about having their operation in a training hospital setting. The second thing is, does it lead to any improvement? We had our initial cut of data, 130 patients between 2010 and 2012. The next lot, much the same sort of volume, and we had one of the surgeons who had a slightly higher incontinence rate, which we thought was variance outside of what was expected. So we went back and reviewed that, looked at the technique, and seeing if that could be changed to improve that. And the second set of data showed that the urinary incontinence, more than three pads a day, is now missing in all groups, whereas it was a little bit present. But the person who was performing the least best at the start has in fact come up to the rest. So two things happen from this. If you measure and show performance, everyone will get a bit better. And if you've got an outlier or there's variation, that person can improve the most. And this sort of improvement happens in a small space of time. It leads to better outcomes and lower cost. Because incontinence is quite a costly complication, but it's socially very disabling. These are the reports that we'll get from the Monash Centre, and these ones are slightly more complicated, and I apologise for that. They are called funnel plots. And just to talk you through it very briefly, the red line along here is the average. The Axis down here, x-axis, is the number of cases that the surgeon does. So these people here are really high volume surgeons. Above the line is generally a worse outcome. And below the line is generally a better than average outcome. The surgeon who gets the report confidentially based on their outcomes is a red dot. And every other measure is a grey dot. So it's de-identified to the surgeons. You don't know which one they are, but you know where you sit in relation to others. And this gives you an idea based on volume of work and outcome where you sit. And this is the most valid, accurate way of giving feedback. And this is the reports that come from the Monash Registry six monthly to the surgeons. They now get them requested, whereas before they were pushing them out. In technology, you either push things out to people, you get notified, or you pull stuff, I want to see this, now most of the surgeons are requesting pulling their data, not it being pushed out to them. So there are different things here. There's high risk prostate cancer with positive margins on surgery. And the one before that was low risk patients with positive margins on surgery. So you expect a low risk patient to have a lower surgical margin rate and that's an indicator of surgical quality. So what happens if you measure some of these things over time? I'm sorry, this was just a graph looking at urinary tract function showing that in New Zealand where our continence rate was set at around about the 60 to 70 percent, we would be in Christchurch set along just above the average level here. So we again can use this as benchmarking against where are we in relation to others. So this graph's another important one from Australia where they put out the percentage of patients with positive surgical margin, which went from a higher level, followed over time and reduced. A positive surgical margin means residual disease is left, means you're more likely to have a recurrence, means you're more likely to need some extra adjuvant treatment, such as radiotherapy on top of surgery, and it costs you money. Over time, feedback to the surgeons led to a reduction in margin rate, led to a lower cost and led to a better outcome. And this is all done just by looking at the patient's results from that own surgeon. This is another graph from the UK, and I apologise for making it slightly complicated, but as we've heard, the more you do, the better you get at it. Over four years in the UK, where they measured all of the British surgeon's data, the average number of cases per surgeon went from 6 to 31. Just by feedback, 
and centralisation and increasing volume meant their outcomes were going to be better. And so we've got the advantage that we can look at all of the British results and compare them to our results. And that's a useful thing for benchmarking. So there's a number of issues with this. Elephant in the room is who owns the data. Should the patients be able to see who gets the best outcomes and drive that? And that is a very controversial area. We've had a very good bone joint registry in New Zealand, run and organised by the surgeon, improving the outcomes of all that's completely confidential. All of this information is confidential and it's vital in our system that we have a confidence system built up that the data is accurate, that there's no associated cherry picking of only good cases and feedback to the surgeons as this is what their outcome is and on the basis of that, that has been shown to be the most rapid way of getting the best overall care to a community improving rather than an individual looking after an individual. So there is controversy over where the data should be, who should be able to see it and it is set up as a confidential, accurate with feedback that's relevant to the person doing the treatment with a goal to improve the quality of care overall. But the steering committee has the ability to handle things where there's variance that's too much of a problem outside of usual and there's a standard process for dealing with poor performance. So what's the future options for this? Um, we're looking with the Southern Cancer Network with the registry who they need to go back to the ministry who says to them, how much money are we going to save if we do this? It's going to be a cost, how much is it going to be in it for us? We've got some ability to answer some of those questions for the ministry. Second is Movember has a global project. They're doing a slightly broader assessment and with our system we are the only place that might have the ability to get a complete country with registry information and that would be my goal. We have shown that with collaboration we'll get quality improvement and reduction in cost and there are a lot of future funded add-on projects that we can do and we are grateful for the Prostate Cancer Foundation for New Zealand for being the first group to donate some money to assist this project getting underway. So thank you.